Let's say that physically you are, you can be called, let's say we have two genders, male, female. So I'll just be pointing, you just keep on answering the questions, what I'll be asking. Your gender is? Shoot, I shoot the answer. Yeah, gender is? Female. Ages? Ages. Country is? Austria, country is? India. Workplaces? Saptarishi <laughs> Hall. <laughs> and your workplaces? <laughs> Texas. Okay. Um, born in which religion? Atheism. 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 Okay, it's fine. E even that's a religion, atheism. <laughs> Secularism. Oh, what a word. <laughs> <laughs> now, but the, there are so many differences, age, gender, education, uh, workplace, uh, the country where you are staying, right? It's all different. But one similarity, now I'll go in between these two different people who are sitting in front of me is both are human beings. Gender comes after. Right? Age comes after, education comes after. Now I am going to go for the unifying factors. First, what I questioned was all the line was about the differences in between uh, A and B in the male and the female. Now I am going to go into the unifying factors. Factor number one, both are human beings. Right? Factor number two, their bodies are made of five elements. Right? Right? Factor number three, they both have a sense of I. Factor number four, both have thinking mind. Factor number, unifying factor, both want uh, joy. Right? Factor number six, nobody wants to die. So in your heart, you are also looking for immortality or eternity, whatever it might be. Let's go, you both have mind and you both have consciousness. Now if we go into the, what is the, the base of this mind? What is the base of this consciousness? Then the answer would be, much simpler would be, um, that there is existence which is giving the base, the foundation, the adhara to both. Unit A, unit B, both are conscious. Unit A, unit B, both have mind. Unit A, unit B, both have one common foundation and that existence, very technically if we go, can be called an existence which never dies and was never born, existence which is ever conscious, existence which is ever blissful, existence which is omniscient. So if I go in Sanskrit, it becomes Sat, Chit, Anand and Vyapak. If I go for just one word, then the word would be Brahm. Right? Now, in the core, what is unifying is unifying. But when I say the difference in between a dog and a human being, now two different species, or a dog or a bird, and a bird and a plant, a plant and a tree, or even if I say woman, then there are like a hundred women sitting here. So every woman is different. But if I go into with what masala, with what constituents the bodies were made, now whether male or female, Asian, Chinese, Russian, um, Taiwani, um, German, the bodies are all made of five elements. Now whether you are atheist, whether you are atheist, doesn't matter, the, this, this fundamental truth remains one and the same, non-changeable. So that's the beauty of Vedanta. It doesn't even want you to believe into any God. If you say, I don't believe in God, so fine, we are fine with it. We won't call you a, a dangerous person because you don't believe. Because the reason is that once we begin to layer after layer peel off, and what we'll find deep down, 
would be a one non-dual existence. Now, this non-dual existence, the Brahm, when this gets associated with the Maya, is called Ishwara. This very existence, when get associated with the Antakaranda, mind, intellect, subconscious, ego, unit, one. If I make it more simpler, mind. When it gets connected with mind, that's the jiva. When it gets connected with the maya, it's called the Ishwara. So Ishwara and the jiva. Now every religion might give a different name. The, the Muslim will say we name, name that um, Ishwara as Allah. Then the, we have Sikhs who will say we name that Ishwara as Vahigu. We ask Hindus, they say Rama, Krishna, Vishnu, Shiva, Devi. You know, all the different names come in. But Vedanta goes much deeper than just the variant names only. Because on the names people will again fight. So what Vedanta technical, technically defines is who is Ishwara? The one who is eternal, the one who is pure sattvic, the one who is a knower of all, the one who never forgets its identity. And the jiva is exactly opposite to that. If Ishwara is one, then jivas are many. And jivas have this great ignorance veil, so they don't even know who they are, what and why they are in this, doesn't know anything, and has a, a, a very corrupted mind. So these are the variations, the differences in between the jiva, the individual self, and the Ishvara, or God, right? But Vedanta says, just don't go up till here. Go more deeper into it. And that is, if we remove the maya and the mind, these two things which were separating and creating two different identities. Ishra was great, Jeev was a fool. Ishra was eternal. Jeev doesn't know and is always scared of death. Right? But Vedanta says, leave the maya, leave the mind, and leave the reflection of the Brahma into this mind and the maya. This called in Vijat Chandrade, the word was Vyatirek. You are yet to come to that chapter, right? Vyatirek. Vyatirek means to separate. It sounds pretty similar, no? Vyatirek, separate. <laughs> you need to separate. Like we did in your case. We separated the country of birth. We separated the chronological ages, which was creating the difference. We can also bring the difference of the skin color. We can also bring difference of the religion. But then there were unifying factors also. So when we say tat tvam asi, tat means the Ishwara. Tvam means the individual self. All the jivas, right? Thinking jivas. We won't call a tree a jeev because there is no thinking mind there. But for a bird, for a mammal, for an animal, you know, the word jiva can be very nicely used. Right? And if you have pets at home, you know, they have a character and they have a mind of their own. Right? You just got some demonstration just when I arrived here. So there are some you know, very strong minds and choices which even the animals have. So the mind and the maya is creating the difference in between the individual self and the Ishwara. Tat and Tvam. Then we say go deeper into this Tat. So we leave the maya, we leave the reflection, the abhasa. And then what's their remainder? The remainder is Satchitananda Brahma. And then the Tvam, we say drop the mind, drop the limited ego, drop the sense that I am this body, drop the sense that I am this mind, and drop the reflection, the Abhasa, reflection, Abhasa of Atman. 
So what is remainder? It's a Brahm. Asi means the unifying factor. There is a small bubble in the ocean and then there is a huge tsunami wave. Both are ocean, yet tsunami has its own character and the bubble has its own. And they both have very different timeline and duration in which they will be visible. And the plop bubble goes, dies, and the wave which rose so high also drops down. And then a time comes, there is no bubble, there is no wave, it's just gentle water flowing in the ocean. So, big wave, small wave, big bubble, small bubble, still water. So, tat, tvam, asi. So, we peel off all the differences. So, I am not saying that jiva is Brahm. Remember this. I am saying atma is Brahm. Atma, the pure self. Jiva or the individual self is which has... All the consortium of the mind and the intellect and the sanskaras and the subconscious and the ten senses and the physical body, everything gets involved. So we are just uh, seeing what is the unifying factor. Now this won't happen, one, until you totally understand what is that. And then you don't, uh, you understand what is twam. Twam means you. That means the Ishwara, the God. Right? Now, normally people know what the differences are. But then they don't know what the unifying factor is. In Vedanta Darshan, Adi Shankaracharya gives this beautiful Ad Advait Darshan and it says, drop what is separating you and find what is already unifying you. We don't have to make a bubble of water. The bubble is water. Similarly, I don't have to make Atma Brahm. Atma is Brahm. The only problem is you don't know what Atma is. Otherwise, you don't know what your own real self is. And you see this physical body alone as me. That's why the fear of death is there. That's why fear of losing the loved one is there. That's why the fear of, oh, I'll fail or I want to succeed and this stupid I is just thrusting you in a lot of misery. So Vedanta says, peel all these layers. This is not the only body which you, at the moment what you are living through. Before this you had many, many bodies. And if you don't recognize this eternal truth, you will be having many, many more bodies. And the point is, if you are stupid in this life, you will remain stupid in coming another millions of lives. So better not waste your time. You know, this young boy who was sitting with me, his mother used to come to ashram for last, I think, so 15, 16 years or maybe more than that. She respected and loved me so much. She was uh, trying to be the best seeker as she could. And this Saturday she died. She had some infection which went... Uh, made her very critical. Last three days she lost her mind, but even in her uh, this deranged mind, she was just taking my name and she was asking, take me to Guruma, take me to Guruma. So in a way it's a good thing, no? that she was not remembering her children or money or houses or this or that. Even in those last moments she was more concerned about that please take me to my Guru's ashram. I want to go to ashram. I want to see. Now if those were the last desires and wishes which she was having, that clears up what her next journey would be. Obviously she'll be born in some of my disciples' home. And, and, and you must have seen these young kids, 12, 7 days old kids are being brought to me. Uh, that this new baby has come and so bless this baby. Seven days old baby, twelve days old baby. Who are they? Those who left their last bodies in great desperation that we haven't done the work which they were supposed to do. And the last mindset was about that I want to do this. I want to be the path of jnana in the yoga, right? 
So this went, this goes on, this goes on until the final realization doesn't happen. So Vedanta gives you a very beautiful step-by-step, -step, very organized system. So you focus first on Tvam, who you are. Then you focus on Tat, what is Tat. Then you remove all the differencing points and take in all unifying factors. And then this Mahavakya of Ved. That what is separating is mind and maya, and that which is unifying is the absolute existence. So why it is called Mahavakya? Mahavakya, if I loosely translate in English, becomes the great sentence of Vedas, or the great revelation, or the highest knowledge, which is possible to be attained by any human being. So that is the beauty of Upanishad. Here people are very happy just to become an engineer or a rich person or this or that and they are not worried about the reality or the truth. They are more, more worried about the worldly matters. I'm not saying worldly matters don't have any importance but the human life is not meant just for amassing wealth and just making some big house and getting old and dying out of some disease or accident. No, no, no. Life is to be... What do you want to make out of that? Well, life will be that. But the, the normal tendencies and the trainings given by family and society is about the physical world alone. So all these deeper things are kind of just left with Mahatmas and Swamis alone. And so they are very happy with their Upanishads and Gita and what not. And the normal men and women are, are just running and running and running faster to their own graves. So the, the Rishi says, Tattvam Masi. But this, this isn't said on the very day one when the, somebody comes to the Guru. <laughs> what are they speaking? What does this mean? So it begins from the tiny, tiny thought steps to be taken. That go to temple, do pranam to Bhagwan, do some puja, go for Ganga Asnan, you know, respect your elders. Uh, worship the Brahmin, worship the Guru, you know, small steps, small steps. Until you are able enough and smart enough and mature enough that you can be led into Vedanta. See, this is not philosophy, let me tell you. <laughs> I know you being a philosophy assistant, assistant professor or full professor? Okay. So this, um, this uh, job of yours where you teach philosophy uh, is very interesting in its own way. But Vedanta, although it is also labeled as a philosophy, but in my understanding, more than philosophy, it is your reality. It's your own being. It's your own existence. It's not, it's not like a, a book that you open up and you say, okay, this is what J. Emerson says and this is what the, the uh, so-and-so philosopher is saying or this is what Descartes says, this is what Socrates is saying, this is what Aristotle is saying. You know, all the Western names, yeah? It's not like that. Those were their opinions. The Vedic knowledge was not available to them. And that's the reason when Emerson first got the English translation of Bhagavad Gita, and he said, what a great book this is. He was dancing on the streets. Same goes for uh, Bernard Shaw. When the Bernard Shaw got to, got to uh, understand the, the Vedic knowledge, he was like amazed and astonished. And I'm going to find out that picture. In this, in the, this particular picture, Bernard Shaw carried Swami Bhuaji on his shoulders. When Swamiji gave a, a yoga asana uh, demonstration in Germany, he was there and once Swamiji finished, his asanas, Bernard Shaw walked onto the stage. And Swamiji was not very tall. He was like five feet. 
and and he carried and bernard shaw was a very burly large handsome and tall and big bear type person he lifted swami ji and swami ji is uh, sitting on his shoulder and he said i can't believe this yogi what he did today it was mind boggling for me this is my only way to to show my joy to show my thanks and show my gratitude to swami ji i'm going to find that picture um for benefit all it will be a you know nice nice uh, feel what east gave is not hypothesis of anything it is about finding out the truth of your own existence so nothing is hypothetical like if you read vichar chandrode nothing is hypothetical as we say in pramana the pratyaksha pramana that which it can be encountered directly and i don't need you to say believe this or that believe this or that no so vedanta should be understood like you eat your most delicious meal you relish you enjoy and you absorb right it should be like a delicacy being tasted and just relate with that what is being said just relate with that that's why in first read which archandra del just cross your head you need to go more slow more deeper then the things begin to unfold and to make your mind more ready for vedanta is by you need to simultaneously make your mind more calm more restful more desireless more um very happy and satiated with whatever you have no prejudices no too lusty not too greedy not too angry not too ambitious but very um rooted in the present moment and very conscious so doing your yogic sadhana listening to vedant discourses when these two combine oh something which is then beyond going to happen 